In the last video, we saw that a primary objection to colour reductionism is metamerism. Uh, two very different spectral reflectances can appear perceptually indistinguishable. Now, even if the metamer problem can be solved, there are still some uh, serious obstacles to uh, reducing colours to reflectances. So one of the biggest objections to reductive physicalism appeals to uh, the structure of colour space. Uh, as we saw in the last video, some colours are unique hues, uh, red, green, yellow and blue. Uh, there is a shade of yellow that is neither reddish nor greenish, a shade of red that is neither yellowish nor bluish, uh, and so on. On the other hand, purple is always reddish and bluish to different extents. Uh, orange is always uh, reddish and yellowish. So these are the, uh, these are the binary colours. Red, yellow, blue, the unique hues, uh, red, yellow, blue and green, rather, the unique hues, and then uh, other colours are binary hues. Um, the unique uh, colours are, are, are fundamental, um, binary colours are composed as mixtures of the unique colours. Uh, and we saw that this phenomenology arises due to the opponent process structure of colour vision. We have a red versus green channel and a yellow versus blue channel, uh, and the perceived hue is based on the relative responses of these channels. Now, it certainly seems that this uh, unique binary structure is a central part of what a colour is. I mean, just look at purple. You can immediately see that it appears as a mixture of red and blue. Um, or you can find a red that's pure red. Uh, so it's, it's a necessary feature of what colours are that they have this unique binary structure. So here's the problem. There is no reason to suppose that there is such a unique binary structure to uh, anything in reality that causes colour perceptions. Uh, certainly, s surface spectral reflectances can't be sorted into uh, unique or binary. Um, similarly, there are no unique or binary wavelengths of light. So it would seem that there are no physical properties that correspond adequately to colour perceptions. To put the argument more formally, uh, premise one, for something to be a colour, it must be a hue. If something is a hue, it is either unique or binary. Therefore, if hues are physical properties, those physical properties must admit of a, a unique binary division. But no physical properties have this feature, so colour is not a physical property. Uh, so uh, that's uh, one of the major challenges to, to reductionism. Certainly, uh, it seems that this is a problem for uh, spectral, the, the uh, Bernard Hilbert's spectral reflectance view. So... One response to this kind of problem is to ask, well, must a reduction preserve the unique binary structure? I mean, not every property of the reduced domain needs to be preserved by the reducing domain. The reduced domain in this case is, is colour, the reducing domain uh, is spectral reflectances. So uh, consider, for instance, temperature. Very high temperatures and very low temperatures are such that they cause pain. Uh, at least given appropriate pressures. So this means that we can sort temperatures under a given pressure into those that cause pain and those that don't. Um, we don't require anything in the world to match this structure in order to say that temperature is reducible. Temperature is reducible to the mean kinetic energy of molecules, but nobody would suppose that a certain set of uh, mean kinetic energies uh, has, have the property of pain, whereas uh, other mean kinetic energies don't have the property of pain. Uh, it's rather that pain is, is a feature of how our perceptual systems react to temperature. We don't suppose that it's, it somehow needs to be found uh, in the objective properties in order for temperature to be reducible. Similarly, uh, Paul Churchland points out that we can sort uh, set temperature sensations into cold sensations and warm sensations. Uh, we, we respond to temperatures with two different types of neurons. One registers temperatures above the skin's temperature, another registers temperatures below the skin's temperature. So warm sensations and cold sensations feel qualitatively different. And that is pretty clearly the case. When you feel something warm, it feels quali there's, there's a certain feeling, a qualitative feeling uh, of warmth that's different to the qualitative feeling of cold. <clears throat> but this... Uh, this doesn't map onto anything in reality. Um, in reality, there are simply higher temperatures and lower temperatures. There is no fundamental difference between warm and cold. Again, that's just a feature of our perceptual systems. 
Uh, now, we might think that the distinction between painful and non-painful sensations, or between warm and cold sensations, is somehow fundamental or necessary uh, to what temperature is, that it's a necessary property of temperature that must be preserved by reduction. And it is certainly central to our experience of temperature. <clears throat> but I think clearly, you know, temperature is an objective property, and uh, these features, painfulness, non-painfulness, warmth and cold, those features are not preserved by the objective property of temperature. <clears throat> so similarly, we might ask, you know, why does it matter? Why, do, why would we need to preserve the unique binary structure of colours? I think this is a pretty good point, um, but I think one question is whether the analogy between colour and temperature is really appropriate. So one point is that with the temperature, I would suggest that the distinction between painful and non-painful temperatures and the distinction between uh, the, the sort of qualitative feeling of warmth and the qualitative feeling of coldness, those are experienced as a feature of our reactions. It's not experienced as a property of the temperature itself. So when you put your hand on a hot stove and feel pain, there isn't the slightest temptation to think that the pain is somehow part of the stove itself or part of the temperature itself. We don't experience pain as being a mind-independent property. <clears throat> On the other hand, the unique binary structure does seem to be a property of colour, a, a property of the object. Um, I mean, that's how, it, that's how it appears to us. That's how we experience it. We experience colours as properties of things in the world, and the unique binary structure is part of that. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like a mere feature of our perceptual system, although, of course, it actually is. Uh, now, we might note that also the, the distinction between unique and binary colours is very important in colour science. Um, you know, at any rate, once we jettison these features of colour, uh, we have to say that colour experience involves pretty much massive, you know, significant error. Colours are nothing like what they seem. Um, so that might be a bit of a problem. But I think uh, the, the more important point against this argument is, is this. Arguably, the reduction of temperature does preserve the distinction between painful and non-painful and between warm and cold sensations. <clears throat> so, obviously, we don't assume that the qualitative feeling of pain or the qualitative feeling of warmth are somehow objective. But what we can do is map objective temperatures to sensations in a fairly straightforward way. So, there are objectively higher temperatures and lower temperatures. Temperatures that are higher than a certain point correspond to warm sensations. Temperatures lower than a certain point correspond to cold sensations. As you get higher still, or lower still, you get into painful sensations. Now obviously the exact points of correspondence will vary depending on the person and the context, but there's always going to be a fairly straightforward relationship between the sensations and the objective properties. If we keep the person and the context fixed, then in general, a warm sensation means a higher temperature, painfully warm sensations mean a still higher temperature, cold sensations mean a lower temperature, and painfully cold sensations mean a, a still lower temperature. But there's no way of doing anything like this with unique and binary hues. If you collect all the spectral reflectances that are unique hues and all the spectral reflectances that are binary hues, what you end up with are totally arbitrary sets. Um, so, you know, I mean, imagine if the unique hues all had a reflectance curve that had uh, one or two bumps, whereas the binary hues had a reflectance curve that had three or more bumps. Well, in that case, we'd be quite happy to say that the unique binary distinction is like temperature and hence reducible. But the problem is we just don't have anything like this. We have, you know, when we, when we sort spectral reflectances based on whether they are unique or binary, um, it's completely arbitrary. So... That I think is maybe maybe a more uh, maybe the main problem with this with this response. So, a second uh, maybe more radical response to the unique hue argument is to deny um, the unique binary distinction is actually correct. So, there have been some challenges to the notion that colours are clearly demarcated into unique and binary hues. Uh, in the first place, a rather long tradition in philosophy has held that colours are simple, unanalyzable properties. You can find this sort of view expressed by uh, David Hume, G.E. Moore, and so on. 
it's usually just a kind of basic assumption that isn't argued for, that we can't analyse colours. Um, I won't go into this too much here because it's completely off topic, but G.E. Moore has an argument in Metaethics, the open question argument, which seeks to, throw, seeks to show that moral properties are unanalyzable, And he draws an analogy to colours like yellow. Uh, the assumption is we can't analyse colours into constituent parts. But if we accept the distinction between unique and binary hues, well, actually, we can analyse colours. Uh, orange isn't simple and unanalyzable. It's a mixture of yellow and red. So perhaps um, those who follow this kind of philosophical tradition would be uh, sceptical of the unique binary distinction. Um, I don't really put much weight on philosophical tradition, though. I, I think it's rather simply that people like, people like Hume and Moore just didn't um, really consider colours in in the sort of detail we have today. <clears throat> but there is actually uh, e e empirical evidence against the unique binary distinction, which I will uh, talk about. So J. M. Boston and uh, A. E. Bohm, uh, that should be A. E. Bohm, not A. H. Bohm, uh, in their paper, Empirical Evidence for Unique Hues, present two experiments that challenge the distinction between unique and binary hues. The first experiment uh, uses hue scaling. In hue scaling, the subject is presented with coloured stimuli and asked how much of a certain uh, specified, uh, how much of certain specified colours the stimulus contains. So I might show you orange um, and then sort of say, OK, uh, red, yellow, green, blue, right? How much of those colours does, does this orange contain? And, you know, you might say, well, it contains 60% red and 40% yellow. So it's a slightly reddish orange. Now, the traditional argument for unique hues is that some stimuli are judged to contain one primary colour and not any others. For instance, there is a green where subjects report j just green, but not yellow, blue or obviously red. Now, uh, Bohm, uh, Boston and Bohm point out that if uh, red, green, blue and yellow are really unique in the sense that they are perceptually basic and so compose other binary hues, we need to show that uh, other colours evenly spaced around the colour spectrum uh, as red, green, blue and yellow are, cannot be used to match all other colours. So uh, they, they, they uh, choose the so-called binary colours purple, orange, lime and teal. Now, if red is perceptually basic, then we, should be able, we, we shouldn't be able to describe red as a mixture of any of these colours. But, and I quote, subjects report seeing intermediate primaries in unique hues, in the same way as they report seeing unique primaries in intermediate hues. So when presented with red, subjects uh, see it as a, a mixture of purple and orange. They give a rating of about 50% uh, for purple and 50% for orange. Um, it seems then that red is actually perceived as a mixture of purple and orange. If red is a unique hue, subjects should have assigned zero to all the options. They should have been unable to describe it with the options they were given. You know, in, in the same way that we can't uh, describe yellow uh, with a mixture of red, green and blue. Okay, um, I mean, maybe you can see a bit of green and a yellow, but obviously you can't, you can't sort of match yellow to, to, to using just those colours. So, I mean, defenders of the, the unique hue hypothesis make much of the fact that we can describe all colours as combinations of red, blue, green or yellow. But actually, we can also describe all colours um, as combinations of purple, orange, lime and teal. Uh, all we need are four colours spaced fairly evenly around the colour spectrum. Um, it, those don't have to be the traditional unique hues, but as long as we've got four colours spaced evenly around the colour spectrum, we can describe unique hues uh, in just the same way as we would usually use unique hues to describe binary hues. In a second experiment, Boston and Bohm uh, studied the effects of instructions on participants' judgments. So when asked to identify a red that is neither bluish nor yellowish, uh, we will tend to pick out uh, so-called unique red. But if subjects are asked to identify a red that is neither purplish nor yellowish, they pick out a much more orangey shade of red. Uh, un under the uh, first set of instructions, the orangey shade would be considered yellowish. Under the second, it isn't. 
Now notice that if the hue theory, the unique hue theory is correct, it shouldn't make any difference. Under the unique hue theory, a purplish red is just a red that has some bluish elements. So we would expect that asking participants to choose a red that's neither purplish nor yellowish would have the same result as asking them to choose a red that's neither bluish nor yellowish. In any case, uh, the fact that uh, when, we, when we ask them to choose a red that's uh, purplish or yellowish, they end up choosing a more orangey red, a red that would more normally be identified as having a yellowish component, um, is itself, uh, again, a bit of a problem for uh, the unique hue theory. So, I mean, these are pretty serious challenges. Um, however, you know, it, uh, I'm not entirely sure what to think about these, but there are a number of uh, reasons to believe in the unique binary distinction. So I think it's maybe worth just exploring some of the reasons why, um, why people believe in this. So first of all, uh, there is the phenomenology. Uh, so, you know, phenomenology is the study of experience and consciousness from the first person point of view. And if we re reflect on our experience of colour, I think it does seem as though some colours are basic, whereas others are mixtures. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my uh, observations have been infected by standard colour theory. But to me, um, the way I experience colour, it, it, it does seem to me that you know, there, there is a red that is just pure red and whereas something like orange is a mixture of red and yellow. So it seems to me to capture the phenomenology. So, you know, how, what, what do we say about Boston and Bohm's um, hue scaling experiment here? Well, I think that what might be going on um, in the hue scaling experiment um, is that, you know, red is between purple and orange. So if we ask people to describe how much uh, of each there is in red, it's not surprising that they might say 50% of each. I mean, really, this just reflects uh, a judgment about the place of red on the colour spectrum. In fact, I'd make a, a stronger claim here. If red is unique and purple is a mixture of red and blue, while orange is a mixture of red and yellow, uh, well, then Boston and Bohm's hue scaling results aren't really surprising. We say that red contains 50% purple and 50% orange because these colours literally do overlap in that ray. Purple is about 50% red, orange is about 50% red, so you know you can make red by taking those parts of purple and orange. Um, as for Boston and Bohm's second experiment, I'm, I'm less sure how to respond to that, um, but you know that might uh, uh, at least deal with the hue scaling experiment. But anyway, the point is, is that I think that there there is the support from, from just the phenomenology of colour. Um, it seems to me that, that the unique binary distinction makes a lot of sense from that point of view. Uh, second, uh, I guess a, just a more general point, is that the brain you know, tends to maximise efficiency. It does things as simply as possible. Simplicity saves energy and reduces the chances of error. Now, why on earth would our cognitive system encode a host of perceptually basic colours when it could get away with mixing them? Um, I mean, indeed, you know, it's surely not possible that every colour is perceptually basic. There are just too many. We can distinguish about one million colours. So surely there must be some distinction between unique and binary colours. Perhaps we're wrong that uh, red, green, blue and yellow are unique. But all we need for the argument against reductionism is the distinction itself. Provided that there are colours that are unique and other colours that are perceived as mixtures, we have the argument against, uh, against reductionism. And it does seem rather unlikely, to me at least, that, that there would be about a million perceptually basic colours. Surely some of them are mixtures. Okay, third, the, uh, the distinction is supported by studies of infants, by studying how infants split colours into different categories. Now, obviously, we can't simply ask infants how they split the world into categories. Uh, instead, we measure how long they spend looking at objects, and we assume that, in general, they spend longer looking at novel stimuli. Suppose we show a, an infant uh, stimuli A and stimuli B. If the baby considers A and B to be different, it will spend longer looking at B than if it considered them to be the same. So if A and B are identical colours, for instance, it will spend less time looking at B. If A is blue and B is yellow, obviously very different colours, it will look at B for longer. So by measuring how the, the amount of time spent observing a stimulus, we can make some judgments about how the baby is categorising that stimulus. 
In a study by Bornstein, Kesson and Weitzkopf called uh, Colour, Vision and Hue Categorization in Young Human Infants, infants were shown lights 30 nanometers apart and the time of gaze was measured. For instance, infants were shown a 480 nanometer light, then they were shown either a uh, 450 nanometer light or a 510 nanometer light. Now, adults judge the 480 nanometer light to be more like the 550 nanometer light than the 510 nanometer light. It turns out that infants make the same judgments. Indeed, uh, infant judgments seem to match adult judgments in general. Just as with adults, it appears that the colour space of infants is divided into four similarity classes centred on red, green, yellow and blue, which are what we traditionally think of as the unique hues. Um, so that seems to support the distinction. Fourth, there is evidence that the unique binary distinction is culturally universal. Uh, so uh, first we can consider the development of colour terms in languages. Not all languages have the same colour categories. Some languages have a very impoverished colour vocabulary. Uh, they make very few distinctions between colours. Uh, others, like English, have uh, an extremely rich vocabulary for colours. A very famous study by Brent Berlin and Paul Kay examined how colour categorization develops. Now the general rules are as follows. All languages contain terms for black and white. Uh, if a language contains three colour terms, it will contain a term for red. If a language contains four colour terms, it will contain a term for either green or yellow. Uh, if it contains five colour terms, it will contain a term for both green and yellow. If it contains six colour terms, it will contain a term for blue. If it contains seven colour terms, it will contain a term for brown. Uh, and if it contains eight, it will uh, contain a term for pink or purple or orange or grey. And it sort of expands from there. But uh, the important point for us is that uh, as we move into the colour terms, the first ones we get are red, green and yellow, then blue. Um, and we would expect these ones to come first if these are the unique hues, if these hues have special status. So that would, again, seem to support uh, the, uh, the status of these, these colours as unique hues. I should note, however, you need to bear in mind that the colour naming debate uh, has been a source of great controversy in anthropology and linguistics. I won't go into it here, um, but I suggest you look it up if, if you're at all interested. Just go on Google, type in colour naming debate, and you'll find um, a lot of interesting material about this. And, and uh, what I've said here is is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, second, a study by E. H. Roche reported in her paper Natural Categories. Roche looked at the Dani people of New Guinea, whose language contains terms only for black and white. She divided subjects into two groups. The first group were shown samples of unique hues and asked to assign them names. The second group were shown samples of binary hues and asked to assign them names. She then showed each group various colour samples and asked them to pick out examples of the hues they named. The group who were shown unique hues uh, and asked to pick out the, the, these unique hues required much less time than the binary hue group, which again, this suggests a, a, a special uh, culturally universal perceptual salience to uh, red, green, yellow and blue. Okay, fifth, the phenomenon of invariant hues. In most cases, the perceived hue of a stimulus changes with increased brightness. This is known as the bezold brook shift. No idea if I'm pronouncing that right, um, but that's what it looks like, bezold brook shift. If you increase the brightness of a light, but keep the wavelength the same, the perceived hue of lights below 500 nanometers will shift towards blue, uh, whereas the perceived hue of lights above 500 nanometers will shift towards yellow. There are three exceptions, um, the invariant hues. Uh, these are perceived as blue, green and yellow, and some have suggested that these match the unique hues for these colors. Maybe this won't work um, for you because colour perception is different for different people, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So look at this colour. Um, now all I'm going to do is increase the brightness, right? That's it. That's all I'm doing. Now, as you can see, this is far more yellow, uh, at least to me. This looks very green. I can't really see much yellow in there at all. This is very yellowish. Um, the perceived hue has shifted towards the yellow, but as I said, all I did was increase the brightness. On the other hand, uh, look at this blue. Um, again, that looks like just a, 
just a straight blue to me. I don't see much of any other colour in there. If I increase the brightness, it just gets brighter. Uh, the hue, uh, to my eyes, doesn't seem to get. Uh, it doesn't seem to get more green. It doesn't seem to get more red. Um, it's it, either way. It's just blue. Uh, at least it seems to me. In both cases, we have a kind of pure blue. This is a darker blue. This is a lighter blue. Um, I don't know, maybe it will look different to you because, as I say, uh, everybody's perceptual system is different and so, you know, that might not have worked. But, um, I mean, you get the point, right? And now, of course, this uh, last point, this fifth point, is rather less decisive because um, unique red doesn't appear to be among the invariant hues. Uh, but, it, you know, possibly there is uh, an overlap with respect to unique yellow, uh, unique green and unique blue. So... Um, now all of all of this all of this evidence is uh, obviously open to, to criticism. Um, I must say that all things considered, I think that the unique binary distinction is probably sound, and that the unique hues are red, green, blue, and yellow. But if you wish to defend color reductionism from the argument based on unique hues, uh, certainly you may want to consider challenging the distinction. And I, I think that there are uh, genuinely plausible challenges to it. Um, however, even if we managed to uh, displace the distinction between unique and binary hues, this doesn't necessarily save reductionism. Uh, the unique binary distinction isn't the only way of running this uh, argument based on the structure of colour space. We can make essentially the same argument in several other ways because uh, there are arguably numerous salient features of colours that fail to be reducible. So let's just remind ourselves of the, of the challenge. The challenge from un the unique binary distinction is that when we consider the structure of colour space, we, s we find that colours exhibit a distinction between unique hues and binary hues. And this distinction is not shared by any objective physical property. So colour is not reducible to a physical property. Now the general form of the argument is, you know, if something is a colour, it must have property X. But spectral reflectances do not have property X, so colours are not spectral reflectances. And actually, we could generalise that further, you know, uh, if something is a colour, it must have property X, but nothing in the external world has property X, so nothing in the external world is a colour. And there are many features of the structure of colour space that the critic of reductionism can plug into this argument, so let's go through a few of them. A second argument is that colours are saturated or unsaturated. Again, it's not clear that we can really give any sense to the notion of a, a saturated or unsaturated spectral reflectance. Uh, I guess part of this problem is because it only takes two colours to uh, to sort of cancel each other. If you have a blue, you can desaturate the blue by uh, by making it reflect more wavelengths in the yellow part of the spectrum. So many so-called desaturated colours are actually re reflecting more light, not less. Um, but of course that doesn't always work. Uh, if you change the surface uh, of, of a blue object so that it reflects more in the redder parts of the spectrum, you'll get a deep purple. Um, so that won't desaturate it. We just change the hue. So, you know, in, in what sense is, is, is there to a saturated or desaturated reflectance? Now, I think this is rather more questionable than the argument from unique hues. We saw last time Paul Churchland's idea of the, the canonical approximation, the ellipse. Now, Churchland would argue that the tilt of the ellipse gives us saturation. Um, but, you know, if Churchland's hypothesis fails, then we have another respect in which a seemingly uh, necessary property of colour is not found in the external world. Third, colours have an opponent structure. This is why uh, certain colours are impossible. Red opposes green and yellow opposes blue. Uh, this opponent structure is not realised physically. There's no sense in which uh, red reflectances are opposed to green reflectances, whereas blue reflectances are compatible with green reflectances. Uh, so, let me make a, a few speculative comments about this case. Uh, do colours have an opponent structure? Well, we certainly assumed they did in uh, in the first video when we talked about colour science. But there's an interesting study by Hewitt Crane and Thomas Piantonida called On Seeing Reddish Green and Yellowish Blue, in which they used a complicated experimental setup to generate uh, these so-called impossible colours in the peripheral visual field. Uh, people reported seeing reddish greens and yellowish blues. Now, uh, these were 
mere illusions. Um, it involved uh, exploiting the the blind spot and the filling in effect. They were they were illusions, but that doesn't in any way diffuse the criticism. The point of opponency is that uh, red and green and yellow and blue necessarily oppose each other. If there are concept contexts where we would report seeing reddish green and yellowish blue, then this claim is false. They're they're not they're not really opposing. Um, you know, there are contexts where they can mix. The uh, opponency is not a necessary property of the colours, um, in which case the uh, the argument from opponency would seem to fail. Uh, in any case, I have a suspicion um, that you can see impossible colours in more standard scenarios, uh, in actually quite easy scenarios. Uh, so I'm going to show you some colours. Uh, and I want you to put aside the, the knowledge of colour science that we have from the first video. I just want you to ask yourself, what is the phenomenology, right? What's the most natural way of describing these colours? So let's start with red and green. This is a simple colour spectrum from red to green. Uh, the claim is that there is no reddish green or greenish red. Now, am I just nuts or does this colour in the middle kind of look like a uh, reddish green or greenish red? Uh, here's a, a slide of sort of two of the colours from, from the middle. This is slightly more to the red side, this is slightly more to the green side. Uh, I don't know, I mean, that kind of looks like there's a combination of green and red in these two colours. Uh, I mean, it seems to me like that would be a natural way of describing them, that they sort of combine green and red. Uh, I mean, more naturally, of course, we'd probably call them maybe a, a murky yellow or or perhaps... A uh, murky yellowy browny sort of color, um, but then now I think about it, uh, yellowy brown colors do seem like a sort of mixture of red and green. In, in the same way that purple seems like a mixture of red and blue, purples are, are reddish blues or bluish reds. Is it possible that that these browny yellow colors are reddish greens? Uh, the phenomenology isn't clear to me, but it, it it's not clear to it certainly isn't just obvious that red and green are not compatible. So here's a, a, a yellow-blue slide. Now the colour in, in the middle here is actually grey, so there's no point showing you a slide of that. Um, uh, grey you know, gray doesn't seem like a mixture of yellow and blue, at least out of context. But when put in the context of a, color, of a spectrum, if you just focus on, on this bit in the middle, that does sort of seem like a mixture of yellow and blue, doesn't it? Well, I can tell you're maybe not convinced, so here's a more powerful example. This is a spectrum from red to green using a darker green. Now, that these sure look like reddish greens and greenish reds to me. Uh, that seems like the most... I don't really know how else to... This colour here, how do you describe that if not um, a, a sort of greenish red? And that's a slightly reddish green, right? That just... That seems like that's what we're looking at here. I'll make a prediction. Show this image to people who know nothing about colour science and ask them to describe, uh, I guess, these sort of colours in the middle. And I bet anything that they'll say something like, oh, it's a slightly reddish green, something like that. Now, uh, this effect uh, depends on context. If you were to look at just, um, if you were to take one of these colours from the middle and just look at it on its own, uh, you probably would lose the the effect you you wouldn't see it as a reddish green um, but but all colors uh, depend on context right we saw that with uh, some of the color illusions in the last video as you change the surrounding colors the perceived color of an object can change so the fact that greenish reds and reddish greens are dependent on context um, that's not a problem at all that's the same for, for all colors um, again this is speculative and maybe I'm just crazy but uh, certainly there's, you know, there's a consensus in colour science that mixtures of yellow and blue and mixtures of red and green are just perceptually impossible. But it seems to me that there are actually very simple contexts where such colours can be generated. So uh, this suggests one way to diffuse the argument from opponent structure. Actually, colours don't have an opponent structure. Red does not oppose green. Um, there are contexts, admittedly very specific contexts, where we can perceive reddish greens and greenish reds possibly possibly um, but this would end up sort of overthrowing a lot of current color science so as I say it's a bit more speculative okay fourth 
There's a distinction between uh, related and unrelated colours. We say that a colour is unrelated if it is seen in isolation against a uh, like a black or a neutral background. Um, now, some colours are necessarily related. They are seen only against the background of other colours. For instance, brown can be seen only if other, usually lighter colours, uh, are seen at the same time. Um, an object that appears brown against a light background will appear orange against a dark one. So this suggests that brown is a relational property. Uh, it depends on the relation between an, uh, the, the object and its surround. But of course, surface spectral reflectances are not relational. Now, Byrne and Hilbert respond to this, that we have to be careful not to conflate the conditions necessary for, for perception with what is perceived. The conditions necessary to see an object as brown depend on the relations between the object and the, uh, and the illumination of the surround. But this, it doesn't follow from this that brown itself depends on a relation between the object and its surround. Bear in mind that in general, colour constancy requires making use of information from the entire scene. We don't just look at objects in isolation. The only way we can keep track of colours is by taking cues from other objects and other illuminants around them. Uh, colour perception is better in some conditions than others. In some conditions we can't see brown, in others we can see brown. That's not surprising. Still, um, there's maybe still a bit of a problem here, which is, you know, look, what appears brown against a light background will appear orange against a dark one. This is the case for all browns. So this raises a question. Is the object really brown or really orange? We could say the object is really brown and perceiving it accurately requires conditions A, B and C, or we could say that the object is really orange and perceiving it accurately requires conditions X, Y and Z. How do we judge? I mean, maybe this is more of a, a sceptical problem, so we're slightly changing, changing the problem. It's not so much a, about whether or not it's reducible. This is more a sceptical question question of how we can know what colour it is really. But still, you know, colour reductionists will, will need to deal with, with this problem. Okay, uh, so a final version of this argument from the structure of colour space is that colours can be ordered systematically. Um, we can order colours in terms of hue, lightness and saturation, and we can talk about the relations between different colours. For instance, purple resembles blue more than it resembles green. Um, and that seems like a pretty important feature of our uh, perception of, of colours. Um, but these relations of similarity between colours are not preserved by the relations of similarity between physical properties. Uh, this graph shows the reflectances of, uh, of, of green at the bottom here, blue and purple at the top. There doesn't appear to be any sense in which the top reflectance is more similar to the middle reflectance than the bottom one. Uh, indeed, if we were just looking at the reflectances, we would probably say that blue is more similar to green than it is to purple. But um, in fact, blues uh, are very often usually similar, more similar to purples, right? So, you know, that, that's uh, it, we, we have these relations of similarity between colours, and yet these relations are not preserved uh, by, by the um, spectral reflectances. I mean, one source of this problem is, yet again, metamerism, uh, obviously, because different colours will have very different spectral reflectance curves. So obviously you can kind of construct uh, difficult examples for, for the uh, relations between colours. Another source is that the spectral sensitivity of long and medium wavelength cones overlaps much more than the sensitivity of medium and short wavelength cones. So the relations between uh, perceived colours end up being at odds with uh, the relations between whatever the physical causes of colours are. Uh, so overall then, we we have this argument from the structure of colour space, and there are many ways of running this argument. Uh, we've looked at uh, the unique binary distinction, saturation, opponency, the related unrelated distinction, and uh, the, the sort of systematic ordering of colours, the relations of similarity between colours. The challenge then is that none of these salient properties of colours, or at least few of these salient properties, can be found in any mind-independent property. I guess one way of summing up all of the problems for reductionism is this. The eye certainly responds to real features of the world. It responds to uh, spectral energy, relative reflectance, wavelengths, and so on. 
that these physical properties obviously influence perceived colour, and that's what explains the fact that there's widespread agreement on colour judgments and the fact that colour perception gives us knowledge of objects. The problems for reductionism arise because the eye responds in a very coarse way. Humans have only three photoreceptors uh, in, in the cones, in three photoreceptors involved in colour vision, and that's nowhere near enough to uh, recover precise information about spectral reflectance or about wavelength or whatever. Very different reflectance profiles prompt the same response. Um, and of course the coarseness is, is amplified by the mechanisms that produce colour constancy. On the one hand, colour constancy allows colour judgments to be uh, relatively stable over different illumination, but it also induces various illusions and makes us unable to uh, distinguish different wavelengths. Uh, so, um, those were some of the challenges to reductionism. Um, I mean, we saw at the beginning that reductionism is a very appealing theory in many ways. Um, it seems very much in line with science, and it certainly allows us to preserve common sense. But there are some very serious uh, problems for it. It's, it's a difficult position to maintain. Uh, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, thanks for watching. Next time, we'll be talking about primitivism.